What a terrifying way to start off a conversation. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> Jeremy, thank you so much for joining us today. Um, you've had a, a long and prolific career, but we want to start at the beginning. So I'm wondering if you could talk a little bit about what first drew you to film. Well, I was always a big film lover, a big appreciator of films. Uh, my dad was a big film buff. And he exposed me quite early on to movies that made an impression on him when he was a young man. And so I, for the longest time when I was a young person, I was hearing about movies like Rome Open City and Les Enfants du Paradis and Children of, uh, Children of Paradise, um, A Place in the Sun, movies that really had a big impact on him. And uh, when uh, Toronto at the time had a very good repertory cinema chain, and we used to go to see some of those movies together. So that was a great introduction for me into art house cinema, into the history of cinema. And so that coupled with my love of television and everything media related anyway, sort of led me to believe that there might be a career opportunity in that arena, but I really didn't know anybody who was involved in film or filmmaking. So it was a very abstract notion. Um, I just knew that I was you know, really obsessed with movies and reading about them and watching them all the time. And then when it came time to decide what I was going to do after graduating from high school, I, I thought about a number of things that were sort of arts related. My father was also a painter, so there was art in our house all the time and discussions about art. Um, but, um, you know, film seemed to be the thing I had the most inclination for and I uh, applied to film school and I went and as soon as I started making films in school, I felt like that was something that was really um, suited to my personality, my temperament, my interests. Um, it felt like a very natural fit. Um, I still didn't know how I was going to have a career doing it, but I liked the idea of that being my medium of choice as a way of exploring, you know, artistic expression. And so you went to Ryerson, and then you went to AFI. Uh -huh. What was the perception of, of television at that time? You mentioned that you were interested in film and television and other media. Uh -huh. um, at that time, was television looked at as it is now? No, the whole TV thing you know, was, hadn't really started in terms of the Renaissance, the, the, what they're calling the new golden age of TV, hadn't really begun yet. And you know, I certainly didn't see myself having a career in TV. I enjoyed television growing up, and I watched a lot of it. But I, you know, for me, film was really the thing. Like in terms of our uh, artistic expression, film was something that I felt I was really gravitating towards. And, you know, I imagined that I would, you know, if I was lucky, have an art house film career, make movies that were very personal to me, that would find a kind of smallish but hopefully good audience. And you know, that was like to me, that was what you, you know, that was a model that I could understand. And that was something that people that I started to know through film school, like Adam Agoyan and Patricia Rosema. Um, we didn't go to the same film school, but we knew each other all around the same time through community building and through connections of the personal kind. But um, so I imagined that I would eventually, if I was lucky, have that kind of a career, which is how I began. And I did start as an independent filmmaker, writing and directing my own films. And that began in film school and then continued when I got out. Um, but TV wasn't really on my radar because I just thought it's... Not that I had any sort of um, kind of judgment about television, but it was just, it wasn't producing the kind of work at that time that I thought, you know, I would find a place for myself in. Um, but eventually, after, around the time that I made, after I made Eclipse, my first movie, and then I guess in between that and making The Five Senses, my second movie, something was happening in TV that was clearly um, different. And that was the beginning of HBO making shows like The Wire and... Uh, the Sopranos and Sex in the City, and then you know eventually Six Feet Under, which was the, the second show I ended up doing for American Cable. Queer as Folk was the first one, and so around the time that that was happening, suddenly there were more. It was a more auteurish kind of sense of what TV could be, and there were strong creators, and the material was a little was more edgy and more um, rarefied in a certain way. And so I, I started to see that there could potentially be a place for myself in this world. I just still didn't know really how that would happen, but it was an interesting thing to, to think about. And then eventually it organically happened, um, mainly through the, the world shifting and me being in the right place at the right time. Can you talk a little bit about that? I mean, I'm sure that there's a lot of folks in the audience that, you know, are thinking about what's next in their career, how they, you know, whether they're making uh -huh. a jump to, to television or making their next film. Um, how, how did that work for you? Well, it was an interesting process. I mean, it was, I, uh, to be honest, I actually had tried to make a few efforts in Canadian television at the time because that seemed more available to me. I had made one feature film, Eclipse, that went to Sundance in Berlin and um, I got a certain amount of attention. And I did end up getting a couple of TV shows here to direct and, and I enjoyed doing them. Um, but it didn't really seem to be building towards anything. It was very sporadic and, you know, it was, uh, wasn't something that I was counting on, but it was a way for me to kind of just you know, explore my craft and do something in between making movies. Um, 
But after I did the five senses, uh, it's sort of a long convoluted story how it really happened, but, but two things happened. And I, I owe a lot to individuals who saw my work and responded to it. And one of them was Sheila Hawken, who's a Canadian producer who's now involved in The Handmaid's Tale and um, previously was on Queer as Folk and then The Tudors and The Borges, which I also worked on. And Sheila was somebody who, um, she was a Canadian producer on American shows shooting in Canada. And she was very devoted to the idea of having Canadian directors directing these shows. So what, so up until that point, American shows would come here, they'd bring their directors with them, they'd bring all the key creative people with them, most, most of the creative keys. And there was really no opportunity for Canadian directors on these shows. And she was actually very forward thinking in terms of saying there's a lot of Canadian talent here, a lot of young Canadian talent, and um, we should give them a break. And Queer as Folk was a really good um, show for that because it was a show that was, had a very edgy kind of style. Um, indie filmmakers could bring a lot to it in terms of their own personality. The show had a very flexible, malleable kind of style to it. So it ended up being a really good place for a lot of people to get their first breaks in TV. And, you know, Bruce McDonald got hired on that show and Laurie Lind and David Wellington and John Grayson and many other people who were making films at that time. And, um, and I was one of them. So that was like my first break, which I really owe to Sheila. And then the second break was Six Feet Under, which happened very shortly after that, which came through um, a long convoluted story. But Alan Poole, who was the producer of Six Feet Under, had been on the Sundance Screenwriters Selection Committee for the Screenwriters Lab at, at Sundance. And he had read my script. As, I didn't know him at all, but he, in the slew of scripts that were submitted to the Sundance Screenwriters Lab, mine being one of them, he read the script, really liked it, and recommended it to the lab. And I ended up going to the lab, then making the film very quickly after. And the movie went to Cannes and Directors Fortnight, and then came to the Toronto Film Festival. And I, then I met Alan for the first time at the festival through mutual friends. And he told me that he had read the script and supported it and was a fan. And that was really nice. And then not too long after that, I got a phone call out of the blue about directing the show called Six Feet Under that I never heard of and and eventually put it all together that he was the producer of that show and he had remembered me and remembered my work and he'd seen The Five Senses by that point and really liked it and felt that I would be a good match for that show. And so, you know, he was like the second person in, in a way who really made a huge difference in me getting into television. And then, you know, that that really was the thing that changed everything for me because started my relationship with HBO as my first show in LA. Um, and uh, it was, and it went really well, and and they became very kind of loyal employers in a way. So I, I ended up doing that show for five seasons, and then doing every other thing that HBO was doing pretty much at that time. We we've talked today a lot about um, uh, Canadian filmmakers and and making their first and second and projects, and and today how how hard that can be to transition to the sec the second and third and and. I'm, I'm guessing at that time it was difficult as well. Were, were parts in that in your decision to um, kind of transfer mediums, uh, did that have anything to do with how challenging film was? Yeah, it had to do with it. That was certainly one huge factor. Um, but the other thing was that I really enjoyed doing television. Like doing something like Six Feet Under, which was, you know, my first thing in L.A., was it was really kind of a revelatory experience. I mean, I'd really enjoyed doing Coors Folk, but Six Feet Under was like you know, uh, yet another big leap for me in terms of dealing with an incredible show creator and Alan Ball with an unbelievable cast um, and material that was very, very close to me. Like I felt like something about Six Feet Under really connected to me on a very, very deep level. Um, there was something about the mixture of humor and pathos and the compassion that Alan had for the characters and the, the kind of amazing depth that the actors brought to the roles. It was just something, something about that show that I felt if, if I could ever create something, a TV show, in my wildest dreams, that's the show that I would have created. Like somehow it just like hit me on every level. You know, I would watch every episode and cry, I guess <laughs> just as a viewer. And I felt so blessed to work on that show, really. And um, so that really shifted my sense of what TV could be. Like to me, there was no, no hierarchy of film and TV at that point for me. It was like directing Six Feet Under was as good as directing a movie that would go to Cannes. I was very happy doing it. Um, and, but, but you're right about the other thing, which is that, you know, getting films made was so difficult. And it was more than five years between my first two movies. And I, I really felt underutilized as a director at that time. And I, I really, I wanted to direct and I wanted to explore my craft and I wanted to make things. And I was very, very frustrated for a long time. And there was, it was so difficult getting the five senses made. And I thought, 
you know, I don't really want to be directing for five weeks, which is about how much time you get to shoot an independent film. I don't want to be directing for five weeks every five years. That would kill me. And so when the opportunity came up to direct TV, it was like a gift. You know, it was a chance to work with great actors on good material and, um, you know, just work. But it wasn't just about the work. It was about doing things that were really satisfying. And I was really satisfied doing it. Um, you know, as we see fewer and fewer indie films on big screens, it really feels like prestige television has become an exceptionally desirable place for, you know, young, talented filmmakers to play. Do you think that the types of people who would be making films like The Five Senses back in 1999 are the types of people that are making television now? I, I know for a fact that that's true, actually. And, and if you go to film schools and you talk to students, they all want to direct television. They all want to make TV or create a TV series. It's a big ambition of people now. And I think that, you know, two things have happened. One is that um, there's a, a little bit of a, a, like a, a further rarifying of the art house now so that, you know, movies have never been more available on different platforms in a way. You can look, go to Netflix and you can see 8 million movies so that things are available, they're accessible to people. But that's a much rarer experience as a, as a theater-going experience for people to go and watch movies in that way. And, and the, you know, they call it the graying of the art house, and you know, it's people my age and older who are the few people still going to see art house movies in the cinema. Um, so there is, there is that sense that it's kind of like, just in terms of where the culture is at, it's, it, it, I'm not going to say that it doesn't have the, the, the predominant place in the culture that it used to have. It, it still has an important place, and I still love going to those movies and seeing them. And, but it's, it, there is something else going on in television that's exciting people in a new way. And I think that this, the kind of extended storytelling, you know, is very attractive to people that you can have a, you can get invested in a story and characters and people's lives that you're observing over huge, you know, swaths of time. And that has its own kind of power as a dramatic medium and it has a real fascination for an audience now. And I think that because there is such a porous border now between movies and television, you have all kinds of, you know, Martin Scorsese did the pilot of Boardwalk Empire. And you know, David Fincher's doing television shows and like everybody's doing TV. So it's like you have people at the highest level of, um, of talent, you know, working in that medium. And so you're, and also because there are so many different platforms now and it's not just network TV and you're not just selling soap, you know, and it's, you can do things in that, in the medium that are, that you were not able to do before. And you have people wanting to do it that were never attracted to the medium before. So it's, it, the television has shifted into this new thing, which is, you don't even really want to call it television anymore because most people don't even own a TV anymore. So what is it now? It's, it's just extended storytelling. It's, it's serialized storytelling. It's, it's, you know, it's a 10 hour movie or it's, you know, you know, what's big little lies. It's an, it's a, it's a seven hour movie. It's so, it, you know, I think at this point, I think it's so porous that, there's barely a distinction. You know, like, I mean, television shows are being shown at Sundance now. It's, you know, it's off show the them here as well. And they're being shown here. So it's like, you know, the, it, it almost doesn't matter what medium you're working in. You're making a two-hour movie, great. You're making a seven-hour movie, fantastic. You're doing a 40-hour movie, great. You're doing, you know, whatever. It's, it's all whatever it is. Um, we're, I think we're going to get into uh, prestige TV um, a little more. But one, one last question about um, kind of how you got to where you were, it, it's obvious that looking at your resume, it feels like you're on the Rolodexes of some of the key TV executives, networks like HBO, FX, Showtime, AMC. What suggestions do you have for emerging directors on how to get on their radar? I'm still stuck on this idea of a Rolodex. Uh, <laughs> um, <laughs> Wait, you, you don't have one? <laughs> <laughs> um, <laughs> but the question is how to get on the Rolodex. Well, <laughs> uh, well, yeah, what advice do you give to emerging uh, directors? Maybe not Rolodex, maybe just on their, uh, <laughs> I don't know, their contact list on their phone. <laughs> um, I, you know, I, the only thing I can say to that, because I think everybody has a different path to get where you want to get, but what worked for me was really, oddly, not trying so hard <laughs> to get into that world, because I really, I wasn't so focused on TV when I started in TV. I still considered myself an independent filmmaker, and the things that got me those TV shows were the movies that I made. And, you know, if I, I think if I had been more TV centric in a way, I probably would have had less cachet as a TV director, if if I can say, because I think that you know certainly now in this new world of television, if if what if what interests you, and and there's no again no hierarchy in my mind. If you want to do Grey's Anatomy or This Is Us or all great things. That maybe that's one path. If you want to do some of the kind of things that I'm doing, it's a maybe slightly different path. 
But the, in my, what's worked for me is that I, for a long time, was really writing and directing things that I wanted to make that were very personal to me and projects that I had a deep investment in. And, um, I, and people, I think, if they recognize anything, it was that, that the work was personal and idiosyncratic and um, very subjective. And, you know, I wasn't trying, I never was trying to make a calling card movie to like get myself a job in TV or something. I was just making work that I, that I felt was important for me to make. I won't say that it was important for the world, but I would say it was important for me to make. And I think people recognize you in your work. And you know, if you do something that is personal and meaningful to you, and you're trying to say something from a, from a, a place of authenticity and, a, and hopefully a place of originality, that's what people respond to. Um, and so certainly I never would have gotten uh, Queer as Folk or Six Feet Under or any of the shows after if I had not demonstrated that I had a point of view I guess, or a, a way of making images, a way of telling a story that was particular. Um, because these shows, even now, they want a, they want a vision. I know it's a, it's a complicated thing to explain to people who are not that familiar with the TV world, and you think, oh, well, TV directors are interchangeable, and you know, there are certain skills that you do need to have, which are purely technical in terms of getting things done in a certain amount of time, and doing them efficiently and all that stuff. But they also want you to bring you to the table. They want, to bring a, they want you to bring a point of view and a vision and a, a, um, a sophistication in the way you tell a story and the way you deal with characters and the way you deal with actors and the way you move the camera and what, you know, the choices that you make are very relevant to them, that you make choices that are interesting and unusual and, and, uh, and specific. And so, you know, I think that my advice would be that people should be true to, you should be true to who you are as a filmmaker. You should make things that you care about. And then somebody will recognize that. And if you try to do something generic or that's like something else or that you think is going to help get you a job or whatever, that's probably the least good reason to make something, I would say. Um, you know, you were working on Queer as Folk and uh, Six Feet Under really around the time that Prestige TV um, began in its you know current iteration. And I'm wondering... How? Like, what's the biggest change in the way that TV is made that is you know happened since that time? Like, what's the what's the big thing that is like? Oh, this is this is very different. Um, I think the difference is that, well, it changes all the time. But I think now because there's so many different platforms and there's so much content, it's that the big thing is like you have to make something that cuts through. I think that's the big thing, because. You know, you could almost say that almost everything's been done in a way now. Like people are, they've been pushing boundaries all over the place and stretching form and, you know, doing, like I said, you know, doing seven episode story, doing a 50 hour story, like, or, you know, dealing with very outre kind of content or things that are very adult or sophisticated or that would only have been the, the um, you know, you could only have done in the space of movies before or um, you know, whatever. I mean, they're, they're, they're pushing boundaries in many different ways. So I, I would say now it's the challenge is like, you know, it's almost not enough to do like a really good polished, you know, well-produced, well-directed show. It has to cut through somehow, it has to cut through the noise, the clutter. And so there's a real kind of um, searching and, and, and fascination with finding things that, that are really new and fresh. If you, can, if you can find that thing that is a new way of telling something, that, that's, that's really what it's about. Where, where do you go to find, you know, the most, like your best ideas? Like, is there, are there places or things that inspire you? Um, everything inspires me. I mean, not every, not, not everything bad, <laughs> uh, but things that are, I mean, I can, it, inspiration can come from any medium and I do see a lot of visual art and plays and read books and magazine articles and, you know, inspiration to create things comes from everywhere. And then inspiration as a director, if I'm working on, even on somebody else's material, that also comes from anywhere. Um, yeah, I mean, anything can inspire you, really. You, you mentioned earlier, um, to the idea of doing things that um, you're passionate about, telling stories that matter to you, um, and, and early in your career, you're, you're writing and directing those. Um, when you're working in a show that's already established, that has a showrunner attached, um, do you, did you feel at all that you were losing some of that uh, in, in your journey? And, and, and really, what was that relationship like with you and some of your early showrunners? Yeah, no, it's interesting because, I, you know, weirdly, I never felt like I was losing that because I was working with showrunners who were so strong. I really felt like I was learning from them a lot. And I think because HBO in particular was giving me opportunities that I never would have had in the film world. Like, you know, I went from doing, 
six feet under, which you could see a direct connection between five senses and six feet under. It was, you know, tonally and stylistically, yes, that made sense. But then I was doing Carnival, which I, you know, I never would have thought of doing as a movie, but it really stretched me as a filmmaker in terms of the broad canvas and et cetera, during the depression and the, in the circus world. And it had a kind of, um, you know, mythical quality to it and, and, and fantastic production values and visual effects and all these things. So, and then that led to Rome and, you know, I've never thought I was going to do like sword and sandals and togas, like never in a million years growing up here did I think I would ever be directing that. And then I was, and so I was give, being given opportunities just to stretch my vocabulary as a filmmaker enormously and to, you know, play with different aspects of the medium, um, not just visual effects, but with everything, you know, do, you know, do battle scenes and epic things and, um, and, and very different kinds of stories and work abroad. And, you know, I did Rome in, shot in Rome at Cinecitta and, you know, and that was quite early in my TV experience. And so I was taking huge leaps, you know, in the TV world that never made me feel, oh, I'm really missing out, you know, doing, not doing something else. I was like not missing out at all. I was very excited about the work. And on top of that, working with incredible people, you know, like really, really talented showrunners, um, and beautiful writers and really good actors. And, you know, I, I've worked with a great pool of people here and in, in my own films. I have actors I love and, and are amazing, but it's just anytime your world expands and you get to work with that person and that person and that world and that city and that creator and that DP, and you get to work with so many different people who are so talented, it really, um, and, and also because in TV, because you can do a lot in a year. So, like, with, you know, it would have taken me five years to make a movie. And in that time, I could direct 20 shows with 20 different showrunners or 10 different showrunners or whatever, depending. And, and with hundreds of actors and amazing crew people. I, at Chinichita, I worked with some of the most amazing crew people in the universe. Like, production designers and set decorators and, you know, cameramen. And, like, people who were just so incredible. And... So for me, it just like my world just expanded exponentially like every day. And so, you know, you do get to points sometimes where you're like, oh, like now, for example, I've been doing it for a long time at this point. And now I can step back and maybe say, okay, well, and actually I did it to make Future to Pieces. In fact, I did step back at that point because I felt I'd done it for about 10 years or so by that point. And I, and that was a movie I was very passionate about making. And so I just took a year off from doing that and I just made the movie and that was great. And, you know, I'll do that again. But it's, you know, I, to me it's kind of like, it, none of it's, you don't do any of it with the sense you're giving up something. You just, you do it, you, you do things when you the feels like the time is right. And it felt like doing the things that I did, every job I took was an opportunity. I took it with a really open heart and really wanting to do it and enjoying the process. and. And then when I stopped doing it, I, I felt good about that, too. Um, you know, we're here at Canada's Top Ten um, at the Industry Forum. And I'm wondering, you know, you are, you are a Canadian who works on um, exceptionally uh, popular and successful American shows very often. What, do you think that Canadian TV is due for a sort of similar prestige TV renaissance? Um, sure. <laughs> 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 I mean... Um, there's, there's great opportunities to make great television everywhere in the world. Why not Canada? You know, so, um, and there is amazing talent here. I mean, there's amazing directors and amazing actors and amazing everything. So, and, and our people do travel all over the world and make things everywhere and they should be making it here too. So, I mean, I'm, I'm a little, I, I'm not an expert to talk about what's happening here in television at the moment, so I can't really speak to it, but I would say that every opportunity is here for it to happen. Why not here? What would bring you back to, Canada to do a Canadian show? What would the industry have to look like for you? Um, I don't know. I, I think the it's all about the material, really, and the people that you're working with. And I think if there was, I would, I have, I would have loved to do something here. I'm working on Handmaid's Tale here right now, which is, you know, a, a com combination Canadian and American show. But, you know, it's what drew me back here to do the show is the material. It's a beautiful, it's an incredible show with beautiful talent involved and it's a gift to work on a show like that. So, um, you know, more of that. You, we were talking about showrunners earlier. What do successful showrunners like Ball, Benioff, Weiss uh, have that other showrunners don't? Well, it's a gift, you know, like I think, 
Uh, they're very gifted. And they, they also happen to be the menschiest people in the world. So I don't know if that's part of the... Be a mensch is very important. Being, I actually think being a mensch is really important. But that's aside from talent. You have to have the talent too. And I think all these guys, or Terry Winter, Boardwalk Empire, The Sopranos, like these guys are... Um, you know, it's it's one thing to write a great screenplay. It's another thing to write a screenplay, a great screenplay every week. You know, and to ha to to have that ability to write comp, to, you know, to to be involved in complex storytelling, very strong characterization, characterization, be amazing with dialogue, um, to create a world that has legs. You know, like something that's not going to peter out after a season. That you can really, you know, you can extend that storytelling over time. Um, it's really a, a very specific talent, I think. Especially if you're not doing like a procedural or something. None of the shows that we're talking about are procedurals. So you're not doing like, you know, it's not crime of the week or the, you know, the medical calamity of the week. It's, you know, they're not soaps, but they, although they satisfy often on the way soaps do, um, in that you get very invested in the stories and, you know, there can be complex relationships. But I think, you know, you're dealing at a very high level of storytelling uh, in a medium that's very um, demanding. And so these are people who are able to arc out those things, you know, on the larger sense and also on in the smaller sense. They can, within that episode, they can make an episode powerful and strong and meaningful and funny and moving and all those things. And, you know, some people's specific gifts go in different areas, like Ryan Murphy, who I've worked with, who has a very specific gift for for storytelling, but also for, like, almost, like, intuiting what an what a audience wants and really working to that or serving that and, you know, often going for the shock because he knows in a way that's titillating that's, but he does it in a very sophisticated way. So anyway, that's Ryan has a very particular way of working. Alan Ball is working on another modality, but I think they equally um, understand this kind of very complex storytelling. There's other skills in terms of show running, which are just, you know, really knowing how to cast a show and casting a show means the actors, but it also means the directors and the other writers are going to be on the show and kind of creating a family of people that is going to like make the show great. You know, even if the scripts are great, you don't have the right people together, it's not going to happen. And the showrunner, a good showrunner really knows how to cast the entire thing. They know how to really put it together and they know how to keep it together. So they know how to like keep the family happy and make it feel like a family. And, um, you know, it's a, it's a very specific set of social skills and professional skills. And these guys have them all. Um, from, you know, the very, very outside, it seems like um, Benioff and Weiss have managed to do that on Game of Thrones and uh, really sort of build a, an exceptional machine. And I'm wondering if you could talk about how you first got involved with uh, that particular television show. Um, well, it, it really came out of all the stuff I'd done with HBO before. I've been working with them for a long time already by that point. And um, I actually got asked to do the show in season two, I think. And uh, my father became very ill, unfortunately, and I had to, I started doing the show and then I had to leave. And, um, but, I, but it came about, I think, really through, um, you know, I think just, you know, I was, you know, I was on the lists at HBO and, you know, I think m my name would come up naturally, I think. But, and then I met with uh, David, actually, Benioff, uh, in New York. I was working on Boardwalk Empire and we like went to a restaurant and had lunch together and, that was it, and I got the show. So I guess I didn't screw it up. And uh, and then I was get, I started doing the show, and then as I said, I had to back out of it. And then they didn't really have an opening again until season five. I thought I was never going to get to do the show after that. <laughs> and uh, but then season five, it came up again, and um, and I went and did it, and we just had a fantastic time. It was such a great experience, and um, and that was it. How did you? Or how do you creatively balance pushing things forward when working on a show like Game of Thrones while staying true to the formula that's been built over multiple seasons? Um, I think, you know, with any show, you know, that show as well, you, I guess your job as a director is really to kind of like really understand the show very well, to absorb the DNA of the show into your, you know, into your system, <laughs> your bloodstream. Yeah. And so you, you understand the vernacular of the show. And then the thing is to try to, like, once you sort of absorbed and understand what the show is, is to try to elevate it somehow or do the best possible version of what that show is. And, you know, it's interesting that you asked that question because I, there, there was once a director on the show who did not get asked back. And I asked the, one of the producers why that director didn't get asked back. And they, and they said, well, 
you know, he he did the show, but he didn't challenge the show. It was essentially the the content of it was a, and, and that he the, I think they said he basically was he was too pliable or too agreeable, mm-hmm. which at first you would think well what's wrong with being agreeable but the problem was that you can be too agreeable you, like you can just say like oh yeah sure that's what the show is I'll just do that and then but they don't want that really what they really want is for you to push the boundaries a little bit in a in a nice way not push them in the wrong way mm-hmm. like I've also seen the opposite happen where directors can come in a show and they're like oh, I hate the way the show looks I'm gonna change the whole thing and they're like oh you're doomed because <laughs> that. That, that doesn't work either. So first of all, you have to go in with an appreciation for what the show is. If you want to wreck it, you're in the wrong show. But, you know, the thing is that there's always an opportunity to elevate things. There's always a way of, like, looking at something fresh and and bringing yourself to the show, which is what they really want. They want you, as a filmmaker, to kind of bring you. And if you have nothing to bring to the table, you can execute it, and it's fine, but then you don't have, like, an amazing experience for them. They They want to be stretched, pushed, you know, and uh, so I always try to like find a way to do something that hasn't been done or just or treat something in a way that's fresh. And, you know, I, I've worked on the show with uh, Greg Middleton, the Canadian DP, for every episode I've done on that show. And, you know, we talk a lot about, you know, how to how to make it special and you know, not just do like a nice episode of Game of Thrones, but how to do an amazing episode of Game of Thrones. And it's a lot of work to kind of get to that point where you feel like you're really challenging things and pushing things and, you know, trying to excel in that language. They must trust you to do that when they give you the season opener and the season finale of the, the last season. That was nice. <laughs> <laughs> uh, <laughs> I was very surprised because they had never done that before. Like normally you do two consecutive episodes if you're doing a block and to do the beginning and the end was, I recognized a very unusual thing and I, I really appreciated that. Um, I'm wondering how you work with actors on Game of Thrones. Like so many of these folks have been playing the same character for, you know, seven seasons. And I guess what I'm asking is like when you're working with someone like Peter Dinklage, is it, you know, very rote, you know, you drink some wine, make a cutting remark, you're good. Or like, no. how does that relationship <laughs> even work when they live in it so much? Well, it's like with any show, you know, where actors have been with the show for a while. I mean, there is, I think people from the outside think, oh yeah, well, an actor's been doing a show for a long time. They come in, they know what they're going to do. There's no room for a director. And, but that's so not true because, you know, what they haven't done is that episode, you know, and there's new scenes, new situations, new, new lines that work or don't work, new scenes that are hard to figure out what they're really about. What is the subtext of this scene? You know, what came before it, what came after it. I mean, actors, when they're on a show, they're like, they're just going show to show to show. Like, they don't have time always to stop and think about, about the script that's at, at hand until they're there on the set. I mean, if they're prepared, they've thought about it somewhat and they certainly have learned the lines, but they haven't gone into it with the, with the depth that you've gone into it because when I'm prepping a show, all I have to think about is that show. And the actors really appreciate that. When you get on the show, you've been thinking about it for weeks. And with, and in the, in the instance of Game of Thrones, you've been thinking about it for months. And they've had to think about all kinds of other things. And they're not necessarily that focused on that scene or even that episode. And so when you come in, you say, you know what? You know, Well, first of all, I should also say you have tone meetings with the writers. So there's a lot of stuff that, they, the, that the writers and creators feed to you, subtext of things, why this is important, what does that really mean? You know, all those kind of things. They're, they're feeding you all this stuff so that, you know, when you talk to the actors, you can say, you know what, I talked with Dan and David about this, and this is the most important thing about this scene. You know, it's not that thing. It's actually this. And even though you're saying this, what you really mean is that. And they're like, oh. They, they don't always know that. I like, guess they're not privy to that all that information. They haven't had the time to think it all the way through. So, you know, and then also with performance, it's so subjective, you know. And an actor, even great actors, are not inside their own head and, and, and enough they don't, they're not always so objective about how they fit into the larger picture. Like, they kind of have a sense of what they're doing or what they think the scene is about. And sometimes you need to, like, kind of, like, say, yeah, it seems like this is the right thing, but actually let's talk about this and that and let's approach it from a different direction and maybe you'll get to something else. And, you know, I just, interesting, I had this experience with Holly Hunter on, on um, uh, Here and Now. I did three episodes of that series premiering in February 10th, I believe. Um, <laughs> or 11th something. Anyway, uh, you know, and she's an amazing actor. But still, there was so much to talk about. I mean, and we spent a lot of time doing page turns on the script before we even started shooting. And I do that with most actors. I will, any, 
it's part of my process with actors to sit with them in the prep week and find time when they have time away from the set when they're not shooting that we just sit in an office somewhere and we just do a page turn and go through all their scenes and talk about what might come up and what are issues and does everything sit well with them and do we need to change anything and so we've had all those preliminary conversations before you get to set so you don't have these kind of like I can't say this line, you know, that doesn't happen. But anyway, so with Holly, we'd done all that with Holly and Tim Robbins. We'd gone, gone through the scenes very closely together, big scenes. Lots of changes came out of those things, things that went back to the writers and you know, much discussion. And then, you know, things just come up all the time. And, you know, we have many conversations about how to play scenes because once you're in it and playing it, it's different than talking about it in the abstract. And so even great actors will have questions or will, you know, will want guidance. Actors want direction. This is one thing that like, not everybody is so aware of. But, and um, if I hear any complaint from actors about other directors, it's just that they don't direct them. Because a lot of uh, directors are actually afraid to talk to actors. And actors can be intimidating. And a lot of directors don't, I mean, I didn't have it, very much experience in film school learning about actors. That, so much of what I learned about actors was just by doing, by working with them and understanding what helps, what's helpful to an actor and what isn't. And I still, to this day, I just met Lizzie Moss on Hamay Sale and I was like, what's helpful to you? And she was like, thank you for asking because not every director asks because every actor needs different things. Like some actors you can say just bigger, faster, slower, whatever, and they're great with that. And other actors, are, that's not the thing to say to them. And they want, you know, it, it's more internal. And it's like, you know, it's, so it's like you, you have to know what's helpful to each actor. And sometimes you're working on a show with actors of different levels of experience and different levels of ability. They different they different things. So it's there's always something for a director to bring. It's not just like sure, go ahead, act, and I'll sit behind the camera. And, you know. And I guess to grow that confidence and to grow um, your ability to work with actors, tell, going back to what we started with, the idea of working in television gives you those reps to do it. If you're doing it more often, then you're able to tweak the advice that you give it to particular particular actors, um, work with more actors to understand what they, how they respond to certain direction. For sure, you learn by doing, you learn from, and you learn from amazing people. Mm -hmm. Like I learned from great writers, I learned from great actors. Um, you know, and the, and the amazing thing about the, the renaissance in TV is like the, the level of ta talent, the caliber of talent that's working in TV. So even on Six Feet Under, which was my first American show, I worked with Kathy Bates, and I worked with all these like amazing people, and um, you know I have to go source back how many others, but there were many, and uh, you know, and then all the way through, and I worked with Jessica Lang. You work with like whatever, the lots of people, mm -hmm. and it's you learn from everybody, and you 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 see how you can effectively support them and encourage them and. You also, you're in the cutting room with all of them too, and you see what makes a great performance and how it works. I had an experience with Minnie Driver on a show called The Riches, and you know, I did this episode, which on the surface was really like an Eddie Izzard episode. He was the other lead with Minnie Driver, and it's this. Uh, it's all too much to go into what the whole story is, but there's a storyline where he, he takes a bunch of crystal meth by accident, and and he's like popping off the walls for the entire episode, and and he's amazing, and so you think like, oh my God, is this totally going to be Eddie's episode, and everyone else is going to be like wiped off the screen? And I worked with Minnie and she was great, but uh, you know, going into the cutting room, I thought this is totally Eddie's show. And then I watched it in the cutting room and I was like, holy shit, it's Minnie's show. She's so great and smart. She was calibrating her performance through the show in a way that I wasn't even aware of. And when you put it together, you're like, oh my God, she just stole the entire show. And I mean, he was amazing, but she was doing something as an actor. And I, and I then recalled all these conversations we had and, and the, you know, she had difficulties with certain scenes, but we talked through them, and then, and I was all that conversation, all that stuff was about getting her to this performance that she was incredibly incisive about, and that was that was a big learning thing. We're we're almost ready for questions, um, so think of some. Uh, but the one thing that uh, the last thing we wanted to ask you was, um, you're one of the biggest TV directors in the world. What TV do you watch? Uh, I probably should watch more than I watch. Um, but I, uh, weirdly these days, I'm really into the half hours and I don't direct any half hours. And I'm not known for my comedic stylings. So I don't do a lot of comedy, <laughs> uh, although I'd like to do more. But um, shows I've been watching are like uh, Insecure, I love that, or Atlanta, or Dear White People, or uh, I don't know, lots, there's a lot of, or Smilf I'm loving right now. Um, 
the, I, I don't know. I kind of, I really, maybe it's just because it's not what I'm directing that I, I can really enjoy it and not think about anything other than just enjoying it as a viewer. And they're all, they're also all done at a very high level of uh, accomplishment too. They're beautifully directed and beautifully written and great actors. And so I, um, I, I'm kind of enjoying laughing, watching things. <laughs> We'll, uh, we'll open it up to the audience. I believe that there are microphones that will be run out and given by our lovely volunteers. So uh, put your hands up if you have a question, and then you'll get a microphone. Got one right in the front right here. Hi. Uh, thank you very much for the movies. We very much enjoy them. Um, my question is, how do you handle an audience that is sometimes split between book lovers and film lovers? The book lovers trying to see what they thought reading the books, and the film lovers trying to see a disruption of, of what the book. Are you talking about Game of Thrones, particularly? A, a bit so. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> uh, <I'll pop> <laughs> um, well, I think, you know, it's interesting because when I started doing the show, I thought, you know, when I would get a script, I would see, oh, what's the what's the origin of this in the books? And I would sometimes go to the book and try to find, you know, what is the reference to the Stone Men, for example. And if you're a fan of the show, you might remember that. Um, so, you know, I was like, what are these Stone Men, and what's the, what's the sort of history of that in the books? And and I would go back and look at it, and then it was completely unhelpful to me because the script is the script, the books are the books. And I think if you're like really an ardent fan of both, you kind of are interested in where they diverge and where they don't. And but I think for me as a director, the script is everything. You know, so you know where it came from or what the the other iteration of it was as a novel in the novel is like it's less relevant to than to really what it is on the page and then how I'm going to you know make that concrete in, in filmmaking terms. So um, yeah, I mean to me it's like I. I don't really think about the books at all, you know, when I'm doing that show. It's really just, you know, what is the script? What is this, you know, how does this fit into the larger fabric of the series and not the books? And, uh, you know, how do I do justice to that? Um, uh, I just watched a... Uh Spielberg the documentary um, and in it he says that uh, he's still nervous every single time he steps on set uh, he still doesn't know what he wants to do sometimes and uh, uh, I'm a director as well and I'm sure m m most directors face that kind of thing um, in certain ways can you give us, you gave us a little tidbit of like, you like to do page turns with actors. Can you give us uh, a little sneak peek into your process? Uh, maybe like one or two things that you do to make yourself feel comfortable as you approach one of your shows, something like that? Uh, it's all about prep for me. And that's what kind of gets the butterflies down a little bit is just knowing that you're prepared. And, you know, for me, the, the, Prep starts as early as possible, like as soon as I can get anything in writing, whether it's an outline or a draft or whatever it is. And I can start kind of like sinking into the world of the show. And, you know, depending where you're coming in and the arc of the series, whether you're watching previous episodes or reading scripts that come before yours or just getting deeply into your own script, it's really, um, you know, getting super familiar with what the, the DNA of that show is, is really the big thing. And once you feel like you have a grip on the language of the show and the characters and the story and the tone and all those things, then you start to relax a little bit more and you start to feel like, okay, I, I got this. I got this world. You know, I'm in it. It's harder sometimes with a show that's in its first season where it's still kind of finding itself. And then, you know, you're part of what the show is going to be. Like, you're, you're part of dictating what that DNA becomes. So that's a little scarier sometimes because there's less of a template and there's less to lean on. You have to kind of like create it or help create it. Uh, but that's really exciting too. You know, if you can get past the fear factor, <laughs> it gets to be really fun because you're helping in the creation of something and that's really cool. Um, but I would say to that Spielberg quote, is like, for, I don't get nervous when I walk on the set, but I get nervous on the, in the car on the way to the set. <laughs> and so, but usually for me, like when I'm on the set, What's nice about it is that like all the thousands of things that you're like in prep, you think, 
should I do this or should I do that? Or like, there's many, there's so many things you have to think about. When you're on the set, there's only one thing to think about. It's like that scene, that moment, that minute. And so it, everything just kind of goes, it like focuses down to like one point. And that's very comforting in a way because it's like, all I have to do is just figure this out. I don't need to think about the whole rest of the show or what's tomorrow or the next day. I just have to think about this moment. And then that clarity and simplicity of that is very helpful. And that helps that once I'm sort of in solving a problem or elevating something or working with my collaborators, you know, the actors, the DP, to just kind of like make this thing fly that we're doing, that's fun. That's actually really fun. When I'm in it, it's great. It's just the thinking about it in advance and the thinking about all the possibilities. It's like that's when you get nervous. But, you know, being prepared and then just showing up and being present is, you know, is the, is the way to get past that. But that can, by the way, just in terms of, to your question more specifically, being prepared means, aside from just kind of like familiarizing yourself with everything, it really means breaking down the script in great detail and often storyboarding or all the other things that are involved in that and, you know, getting very precise about how you want to approach something. Still allowing for creativity on the day to come in, but having a plan at least going in. So you have your something to lean on there. Mm-hmm. Um, so you talked a lot about uh, prepping with your actors and um, having all that prep time, but have you been in a situation with not enough prep time and kind of how do you deal with that sort of thing or like a lot of rewrites coming in and, and stuff like that? I think you, I have had that situation. Sometimes scripts are very late. There was even a, a DGA, Directors Guild of America, you know, thing last year about scripts being late and directors not having enough time to prep properly. And they're really trying to change that because directors need their prep. Um, so uh, there has been a bit of a shift to try to, you know, make that a better situation. Um, but I think, you know, you just, you, you do learn, maybe just because I'm old now <laughs> or older, you learn to roll with things a little bit and you, stuff doesn't throw you as much. Like when I was younger, you know, well, although, you know, I learned to roll with it pretty early, I have to say, because I, I think the, the very, very first show I did was a Canadian show called North of 60. And um, I arrived and sat one day and they're like, you know, that scene that was going to be in the baby nursery? I was like, yeah. So I said, well, it's going to take place by the river now. And I was like, <laughs> why? I planned the whole thing for the nursery. <laughs> and they're like, well, you know, there's problems with the nursery. And I don't even know what the reason was. So it was like, okay, we're going to do it by the river. And, um, but so, but that's the kind of thing that happens, you know, where it's like, okay, well, what opportunity does that provide? Like, we're not now. It, the good way of thinking about it is we're not in a cramped room with four walls, and now I'm at I'm at the river, which is very pretty, and um, the snowy river <laughs> in Calgary, and um, so you know you see it as an opportunity, and you just you learn just not to get thrown by stuff, and you're just like. Like, uh, thank God, I'm like, I have a temperament that's not very excitable. <laughs> and, um, you know, I can, I can generally roll with things. And uh, so th it's just part of the whole thing. You just like, you, you, you try to find the best uh, solution to a problem or the, find the opportunity and the change or the challenge and you just kind of go with it. All right, we have time for a couple more questions. There's one here. Are there any, um particular episodes or moments that you're proud of or that are memorable to you over your career? Yeah, there's many. Um, I mean, a lot of them, without getting too specific, I mean, a lot of the things that really get me the most excited are just seeing performance moments sometimes. Like where I remember doing a scene from Six Feet Under that was between Claire and her mother and there was a big like knockout drag out in the kitchen and it was like such a simple scene with two actors but I remember rehearsing the scene I had like chills up my spine and I was like just watching the rehearsal before we shot it was like one of the greatest acting things I'd ever seen at that point and I was like okay we just have to shoot the scene the simplest possible because the performances are right there and I don't want to dilute it I don't want to change it I just want them to be at this level where they're at right now and just capture it and that was so exciting and like there were just Act, such fine actors doing such beautiful work. That's exciting. I had a, a scene had a scene in Here and Now in ep episode four or five, which you'll hopefully you'll see, with Tim Robbins and Holly Hunter. And as I just loved every second of it. They were like it was such a great it was such a great piece of writing. It was a big scene. It was like a five minute scene. It's the end of the episode. It's 
can't tell you what happens. But it's a, it's a big revelatory scene, and it's just the two of them, and it's fucking awesome. They were so great. And so that's exciting for me. And then doing things like, uh, you know, the Hall of Faces in Game of Thrones, or doing things that are, like, really epic and, you know, whatever, or... You know, the wall coming down was, that's pretty big. Um, <laughs> so, you know, whatever, Littlefinger getting killed. It was like, so, like there's, they're great dramatic scenes with great actors or they're epic or they're, they can be meaningful and, and memorable for lots of different reasons. And sometimes it's the experience of doing it. Sometimes you just watch the scene and you're like, holy shit, that's great. Um, so it can be a lot of different things. So the wall comes down, eh? Sorry. Oops. No, uh, <laughs> little finger. What? <laughs> uh, we are all out of time. Uh, I just want to give Jeremy a big thanks for joining us and wrapping up a fantastic uh, Canvas Top Ten Industry Forum. Uh, just some housekeeping notes. Uh, if you have a ticket to the opening night party for Kenda's Top Ten, uh, you can get those uh, just outside of the theater. Volunteers will be handing them out, and the uh, event will be on the sixth floor. And uh, also, there's still tickets available for our lineup of amazing Canadian films, features, and shorts. Um, so support your fellow filmmaker, check out their work, and uh, let's go watch some movies. Thanks, guys.